the Savior, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious God, we give you thanks. You are the one who enlightens us, and your word is a light unto our feet. We, we ask you to bless us as we attempt to know you and to imitate St. Paul, who said that he imitated you. We ask that you would help us to know you better and better, especially through the readings in the letters of St. Paul. Help us to put into practice what we learned today. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. First, a quick summary of the last class. You're used to me by now. This is what I do. Um, we talked about the Gospels. There really is only one Gospel that is the good news or the glad tidings of God. The glad tidings speak of God's victory, establishing universal kingship and inaugurating the new age. The four Gospels were written to people, to different audiences, with different audiences in mind. That's why they're slightly different. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are so similar, we call them the synoptic Gospels, and John's is more symbolic and theological than the others. The Acts of the Apostles is part two of Luke's Gospel, and it shows the continuity between the historical mission of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles, thus guaranteeing the fidelity of the church's teaching to the teaching of Jesus, the Gospels. All right, so now we go to the letters of St. Paul. The first, a little bit about St. Paul, if I can. And once again, a lot of what I'm telling you, teaching you, comes from the New American Bible, from the introductions to the various sections in the Bible and the books themselves. So if it's plagiarism, just know that I'm taking it from the Bible, just like a lot of our forebears did. So hopefully it's not plagiarism. And even if it is, I think it's okay. We know that St. Paul was born in Tarsus. His father was a Roman citizen. This is very important, as we'll see later on. And his family was close to the Pharisaic traditions and customs. Listen as he talks about himself in the letter to the Philippians. He writes, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew parentage, in observance of the law of Pharisee, in zeal I persecuted the church, in righteousness based on the law I was blameless. So he's clearly rooted in, the, in Israel, in their tradition, in their religion, in, um, in the customs, he was a Pharisee, and so he wasn't just a, a marginal Jew, he was a, one of the leaders, and a very passionate one at that. The Catholic Encyclopedia states that since he belonged to the tribe of Benjamin, he was given the name Saul. Saul is the first king of the, the United Kingdom of Judah and Israel, right before David, remember? And um, Saul was also of the tribe of Benjamin. So it's just kind of a neat thing that because he was one of the, the same members of that tribe, he took the name, or his parents gave him the name of one of their, their greatest probably tribal person, Saul, the king of Israel. Okay. He was also known as Paul, especially after his conversion. So he had a Hebrew name and a Greek name, Paul. It makes sense that he should use his Roman name in Greek because he dedicated himself after his conversion to working with the Gentiles. So we don't hear him refer to as Saul anymore after his conversion. It's all Paul. Okay. We know that he went to Jerusalem to study in the school of Gamaliel because he says so. And we can surmise that his father passed along his trade to him, that of being a tent maker. After that, we don't hear anything about him until the martyrdom of Stephen, where Saul first shows up in the Bible. Then we have three accounts of his conversion, and they all differ just a little bit, but basically they tell the same story that we all know quite well. Paul was on his way to, to Jerusalem with papers to arrest more of the Christians, and he was struck down by a blinding light, and a voice came that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Remember, and he said, Who are you, sir? I am the Lord Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Thus began his process of conversion. 
After his conversion and baptism, he started preaching to the Jews, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Then he reports in Galatians 1, 17, that he withdrew to Damascus, most likely to learn and meditate on the scriptures. Then after more travels and five or six years, he is found by Barnabas and brought to Antioch, where they work together for a year and their ministry becomes very effective. A lot of this comes right out of the Acts of the Apostles. The encyclopedia says that the period of 12 years from AD 45 to AD 57 was the most active and fruitful time of Paul's life. It comprises three great apostolic expeditions that began in Antioch and ended in Jerusalem each one. And during these missionary journeys, Paul probably wrote his letters to the Thessalonians, to the Corinthians, the Romans, and Galatians. Paul spent a good time in prison, mostly on bogus charges that he was a disturber of the peace or that he violated Jewish law. He was falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple and was captive for two years by the procurator Felix. In what would mirror Jesus' trial, the new governor, Festus, wanted to send Paul to Jerusalem to be tried by his own people. Just like we, we read in the life of the Passion of Jesus, they said, this is not our concern, send him back. You try him yourselves. They sent Paul. Paul, he wanted to send Paul back to Jerusalem for trial. However, because of, but at this time, Paul appealed to Caesar. He said, I am a Roman, Roman citizen. I have the right to go to Caesar himself. And as soon as he uttered those words, I understand, they had no choice. They had to send him to Caesar because as a Roman citizen, he had the right. Remember I said it was important that his father was a citizen and so was the family. This enabled Paul to go all the way to Rome and preach the good news. Okay. From that point on, he could only be tried in Rome. When Paul was in prison, he taught and wrote, preaching the good news far and wide. When Paul defends himself, you can see throughout the Acts of the Apostles, he confounds his accusers and proves his innocence before the authorities, just like Jesus. Paul was shipped off to Rome with other prisoners, and, the detail, and he details his voyages vividly. We learn of his dangerous journey, his shipwreck on Malta, which enabled him to preach to even more people in far-off lands. Finally, they made it to Rome, where Paul spent two years preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about Jesus Christ. And that's how the Acts of the Apostles ends. Though it's not certain, it seems that Paul wrote many of his epistles and pastoral letters while in captivity, including Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians. It seems certain that Paul's trial in Rome ended with an acquittal because there are references in his letters and the writings of the early church fathers, like St. Clement of Rome, that Paul continued his missionary activity in Crete, Corinth, Philippi, Macedonia, and quite possibly even Spain. He writes in Romans 15 that he wanted to make it to Spain. In fact, it's nearly impossible to determine the exact nature of his travels, since there are so many accounts from his letters and from other early writings. Tradition says that Paul eventually suffered martyrdom near Rome, probably the year 67, close to the basilica which bears his name. He died toward the end of the reign of Nero, having been beheaded with a sword. Again, his Roman citizenship gave him the right to a more merciful death than, say, crucifixion, which is what St. Peter suffered being crucified upside down. Many believe that Paul and Peter both gave their life for Christ on the same day, and so their feast is on the same day. We celebrate the feasts of Saint, the feast of Saints Peter and Paul on June 29th together. Okay. The 14 epistles that are affiliated with Paul are listed immediately after the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible. They're not in chronological order, but they're arranged according to their significance and the extent of their circulation. And also, it generally follows that they, they're listed in descending order of their length. 
beginning with Romans, the longest, and ending with, um, with Philemon, and then Hebrews is last. Listed first are the letters written to the seven churches of Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Thessalonica. Then the letters to the three individuals are included. Timothy, Titus, Philemon, followed by Hebrews, the last to be authenticated. It was long held that Paul actually wrote 13 of the epistles himself. The letter to the Hebrews, remember, does not purport to have been written by Paul, though it was added at the end of the Pauline letters after much discussion and debate. Modern scholarship has shed some new light on them, and many scholars think that Paul literally wrote seven of them. Four are disputed, that is, thought of as not being actually literally written by Paul, although they are clearly inspired by his theology and style. And scholars are divided over the remaining three. But still, and this is important, when we introduce the readings at Mass, we always say, a reading from the letter of St. Paul, Paul to the Ephesians, Corinthians, whatever. Except for the Hebrews. We say a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. But we, the, the, the church clearly wants us to, to identify all of these letters with St. Paul, as tradition has, as we always have tradition. Even though scholars and theologians debate over which ones he actually penned and which ones were inspired by him, the Church wants them all to be identified with St. Paul in our liturgy. Now before we look at the, a little bit into the, each of the 13 epistles, let me just say one other thing. The style of writing for St. Paul and for his contemporaries is important, and it itself can teach us many things today. Paul's letters follow a general pattern of greeting, introduction, affirmation, content, followed by the promise of prayers, more affirmation, and exhortations to remain faithful, and a conclusion. All of these elements serve to teach and get the message across. Even the titles Paul uses for himself, calling himself a slave of Christ, an apostle, the least born of all, and the titles he uses for the people, you are called to be holy, brothers and sisters, beloved, called to be children of God. These even can teach us something, even the titles that he uses. And his affirmations are meant to serve as an encouragement to keep going, in assuring them of his constant prayers for them. He's teaching them to do the same for others. And in recounting his hardships and sufferings, he is giving them and us an example to follow. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. We would do well to imitate this style in our correspondence even today. Sadly, however, because we're more used to a lot of us email and Twitter and text messaging, we don't usually begin Dear so-and-so, it is with great love that I write you. I was thinking about you, etc. And here's what I'm writing you about. And please know that I'm praying for you constantly. Please pray for me. Sincerely yours, your name. We just, that's just, it's, it's a lost art, it seems, unless someone is literally writing a letter. Um, typically, our text messages and emails and Twitters just look like, okay with me. Something like that, that's all we would send. So it's a far cry from that. And I'm not saying that all of our texts should be, should follow this pattern, but isn't it neat that, that um, this is even in his style of writing, St. Paul was teaching us many things. And we would do well, I think, to do that when we can with our friends and loved ones. Okay, now let's look at the letters. First, Romans. Once again, the placement of a book is very important, and I think we've been talking about this. You know, the, the placement of the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, is obviously extremely important as they are the center of the old law of the Old Testament. They are the, the cornerstone, the foundation. Then we have in the New Testament, the Gospels. Even though they weren't written first, they belong right there, the first four books in the New Testament because they hold primacy of place. They're the center not only of the New Testament, but of the entire Bible. So, when we get to the letters of St. Paul, 
Romans goes first because Romans holds a special place among all of his letters. It includes a great deal of Paul's theology and understanding of the gospel, including God's offer of salvation to all people of all time. In fact, in the conclusion of the letter, chapter 16, verse 25, Paul writes, according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. So it isn't a long shot to call this, unofficially, the gospel of St. Paul. We don't call it that, okay? But, it, but even here, he says, it is my gospel. It is written most likely when Paul was in Greece, perhaps in Corinth, between 56 and 58 AD. In the letter itself, Paul talks about his missionary activity and his desire to visit Rome again and obtain support from the Romans for his ministry. As with nearly all of his letters, he expresses joy and gratitude for the way they have embraced the faith. Um, and he exhorts them to grow in their faith, especially in the way they treat each other, and to keep their hearts and minds focused on the kingdom of God. From the introduction in the Bible to the letter of the Roman, to the Romans, we read, Unlike in some other communities, Paul doesn't claim that he was the first to bring the faith to Rome. In fact, there is evidence from the secular world that Christianity was already in place before Paul wrote his letter. There's a Roman historian, Suetonius, who he mentions in his writing an edict of the Emperor Claudius around the year AD 49, so perhaps almost uh, eight or ten years before Paul wrote this letter, that the emperor ordered the expulsion of Jews from Rome in connection with a certain person that he called Crestus. He writes that they, they, they follow this man Crestus, and so the emperor has expelled, has expelled them from Rome. Obviously, I think we can assume that they were following Christ, but he had the name wrong. This secular historian. But it's interesting because it shows, you know, what happened and that people from outside Christianity knew a little bit more and more as time went on what was going on. And in Acts 18, we see that Paul met Aquila and Priscilla, who had to flee Rome for this very reason. And that's probably where he heard about the church in Rome and what they needed to learn what was going on there. In fact, if one looks at the introduction to the letter, you can see that Paul is introducing himself to the Romans. He has not met them. He introduces himself to them as a fellow laborer who has heard about what they're experiencing in Rome. And he apologizes to them for not yet seeing them and repeatedly tells them he's hoping to visit them soon. The main idea in the letter to the Romans is to exhort them to hold fast to the teachings they have received, and thus to be justified, that is, to be put in right relationship with God and be saved through their faith in Jesus Christ. Even though Paul writes to those who have accepted the gospel, while lamenting the fact that his own people, the Jews, have rejected it, he does hold out hope that all of Israel can be saved. And isn't this interesting? What a shift. You know, early on, we believe, we, we said that it was first the Jews, the Israelites and the Jews, who received the first covenant, the call from God. When they rejected it, then the Gentiles picked it up. And now Paul is saying, hopefully then it will go the other way now, that the Jews will learn from the Gentiles and they too will be saved. Very interesting. Okay. It's nearly impossible to summarize this letter, like I just tried to do, or any of Paul's letters. Some biblical scholars focus on Paul's treatment of the relationship between Jewish Christians and Gentiles. They can see that that's a big part of the letter. Um, others see in Romans Paul's grand understanding of God's plan for all of creation. And then, of course, Paul himself spends a lot of time talking about his own missionary journeys and his need for the spiritual and financial support of the Romans. Okay, so that's the letter to the Romans. Now, first letter to the Corinthians. I really like the first line in the introduction in the New American Bible. It says this, Paul's first letter to the church of Corinth 
provides us with a fuller insight into the life of an early Christian community of the first generation than any other book in the New Testament. So the Acts of the Apostles teaches us how you know, the Apostles especially wrestled with and dealt with what just happened, you know, the death, the resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. It talks about how they tried to put that into practice in their life and in the life of the church. But in 1 Corinthians especially, we now see, after a little bit of time, how they ran into some roadblocks, if you will, some pretty serious problems, and how they needed to have all of that ironed up. It's very clear that Paul is writing to the Corinthians to correct abuses and to make sure the community maintains the gospel as it was preached to them. Because of this, it is invaluable for us today, as we are unfortunately prone to many of the same abuses and divisions, even within our church. We can only imagine how this small community in the midst of this large and cosmopolitan city had to figure out how to live their faith after those first heady days of conversion and baptism. Naturally, their learning curve was quite steep, and pretty soon after their baptism and conversion, they started to run into problems. Unlike in Rome, Paul was the first to teach the Corinthians the good news on one of his journeys there. And thus, he looks upon the Corinthians as his own children. It's very tender. In chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, he refers to them as his own children and says, I am a spiritual father to you. By the way, here's a quick aside. Just recently in the gospel, we heard Jesus say, call no one on earth your father. And that is, for some people, a stumbling block, especially with Catholics and Orthodox Christians and, and others who use that title. But here we have Paul himself calling himself their spiritual father. Clearly, I don't think when people call me father or Paul or someone else, I don't think people are confusing us with the Almighty, the Everlasting, the Immortal One. But nonetheless, it is this term. It is a spiritual father. Paul looked upon them as his own children. It's really a neat insight. It's clear that this letter was written and sent to address specific questions that were asked of him. Wouldn't it be neat if we had the letter of correspondence that was sent to him saying, look, we have a lot of problems here in Corinth. One, two, three, four. You can almost get those when you read the letter. Man, that would have been a neat thing to see. Paul also responds to things that had been reported to him by Chloe's people, it says in 111. We don't know who Chloe was. Perhaps she had a, a gathering in her house. She was, hers was one of the house churches. But obviously she was influential because she and her people got word to Paul that we're having problems in Corinth. You need to get back here or you need to tell us what to do. In teaching, in addressing all of these problems and things that, that came up, Paul has much to teach the Universal Church. Once again, we see this action unfolding in another text, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, 1 through 11. Here we see how the people embraced the gospel initially, and then how divisions and problems arose. It was while Paul was on his third missionary journey in Ephesus that he received these disturbing reports about the church in Corinth. Most disturbing was the way they were dividing themselves up according to who baptized whom, according to um, the ones who received the faith first, and according to other divisions, perhaps even financially. It was clear that they needed someone from the outside to step in and set things right. We can be thankful that people such as Chloe and her people spoke up. Because of the need to clarify and admonish, Paul wrote this letter, scholars think, around the year 56. Paul is obviously passionate about these things, and when is he not passionate? The words he uses makes it clear that he means business. And how about this thinly veiled threat that he issues in chapter 4, verse 18 through 21? Actually, it's not even thinly veiled. He's really passionate. He's trying to set things right. And here's what he writes in chapter 4, 18 through 21. I had overlooked this. I hadn't seen this until I was writing this yesterday. 
This is what he writes to them. Some have become inflated with pride, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord is willing, and I shall ascertain not the talk of those inflated people, but their power. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And then here he is. Which do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a gentle spirit? Well, he's actually saying, you know, kind of like parents might have said in the past, you know, if you don't stop that, I'm going to give you a spanking. Paul's basically saying, do you want me to come with a rod? Because I can and beat you. <laughs> or I can come with a gentle spirit and love. And that's what I'd like to do. Wow, it's kind of an interesting thing. Among many other things, 1 Corinthians also teaches us a great deal about the Eucharist. It teaches us um, a lot about what it is we celebrate day after day, Sunday after Sunday. You know the lines well. The cup of blessing, isn't it, it, it a participation in the blood of Christ, etc. He's basically saying, how can there be divisions if you celebrate the Eucharist? It is the sacrament of unity. He also teaches us a lot about the resurrection of the body especially in chapter 15. And a lot of that, the writings from that part of the letter are used in our funeral liturgies. Okay, 2 Corinthians. Once again, Paul is called upon to deal with some issues that have arisen in Corinth. We see his passion and his desire for the Corinthians to get back on the right track and live the gospel. The introduction puts it well. One moment Paul is venting his feelings of frustration and uncertainty the next, he's pouring out his relief and affection. Thus, we see a lot of the personal side of Paul as he speaks frankly, plainly with the people. Listen to the way he pours out his heart in the introduction at the beginning of chapter 2. <laughs> chapter 2, 1 through 4. For I decided not to come to you again in painful circumstances. For if I inflict pain on you, then who is there to cheer me except the one pained by me? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not be pained by those in whom I should have rejoiced, confident about all of you that my joy is. My joy is that of all of you. Is that of all of you? For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you might be pained, but that you might know the abundant love I have for you. It's very personal. It shows us, I think, the necessity, the necessity of personalizing the good news. Paul, you notice, doesn't just report back, nope, you need to do this, 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 and this. He's basically pouring out his heart in teaching and exhorting and challenging and chastising the people. It reminds all of us that Yes, the message, of course, is very important, is vitally important, but nonetheless, we, you and I, bring a human element as well, and we have a lot to teach by the way we interact, even while we're teaching. We can imagine Paul's sadness at having to go over the same things again after having written the first letter to them, and maybe another letter. He refers to other letters that he has written, but unfortunately, we only have two. The Corinthians. Now, however, it's more personal for Paul. Some are questioning his commitment and his character, especially because he hasn't been able to return to Corinth as he promised. That's why he spends a lot of time justifying his actions and his role as an apostle. It's in 2 Corinthians that he kind of embarrasses himself. He's saying, look, you, you know, I'm probably the most qualified of all. He said, are there some who is an apostle? Hello, I heard the voice of God. Are there some who think that they're better teachers? I've, I've been all over the, the known world now preaching. And he even embarrasses himself. He says, I can't believe I'm talking like this, but I need to show you that I have the truth and I'm the one you should listen to. Let me say again that this letter is so important for us today because like in the time of the Corinthians, there exists people today who try to preach a gospel different from the one we receive, which is the way he puts it. There are great divisions even in our church today, so we all need to return to the truth, the truth of the gospel again and again.
The fact that it occurred in the time of St. Paul should give us hope today. Okay, and also one, one other little thing in 2 Corinthians, one of my favorite passages, and I know I say this a lot about the Bible, but one of my favorite passages in Paul's letters comes from the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. And this we use in a lot of our funeral liturgies, and I just, I, I love it, I pray about it and think about it all the time. This is what he writes, For we know that if our earthly dwelling, a tent, should be destroyed, we have a building from God, a dwelling not made with human hands, eternal in heaven. And also a little bit later, he has that wonderful line, we walk by faith, not by sight. These are things that we memorize, things that just sing to our soul, things that console us and teach us. They're found throughout Paul's letters. Scholars believe that that was written in Macedonia probably around the year 57. Now, Galatians. We hear about Paul's travels to Galatia and the surrounding area, again, in the Acts of the Apostles. As in Corinth, he initially brought the faith to the Galatians. Similarly, he had to write this letter to clarify and correct some of their practices. There is some difference of opinion as to when the letter was written. Some scholars think it was early, as early as 48, making it one of the earliest, if not the earliest, or as late as 55, depending on how one calculates the timing of the events mentioned. Many people in Galatia had left their pagan practices behind and had adopted Christianity at the preaching of Paul. However, shortly afterwards, others came along and urged them to adopt the ways of Judaism, including circumcision and dietary restrictions. Paul makes it clear that he and he alone has the authority to teach them the truth, whereas the others do not. And once again, his passion and emotion come out, probably even more so than in the first letter to the Corinthians. He writes this, I am amazed that you are so quickly forsaking the one who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Then he writes, not that there is another. And this is what he also writes, as we have said before, and now I say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one you have received, let that one be accursed. That's in chapter 1 as well, 6 through 7 and 9. Or how about this, chapter 3, verse 1. He starts out chapter 3 with this. Oh, stupid Galatians. Wow, talk about passion. Who has bewitched you? And then verse 2 three in chapter three starts out like this are you so stupid isn't that great um so occasionally and i'll say this even on camera that um occasionally you know if i'm writing a birthday card or something i put at the bottom galatians 3 3 a and hopefully just as just because i feel ornery seeing if they'll go look that up and i'll be like oh that's nice are you so stupid but anyway <laughs> i digress Paul repeatedly reminds the Christians in Galatia that they are free from the old law. And thus we see why Paul is so insistent in saying that in Christ we have died to the law. This is something, I don't know if this bothers you as much as it bothers me, but when we listen to Paul or read it, read his letters, it bothers me that he is so insistent saying, why are you still slaves to the law? I mean, the Torah is the law, the greatest law, you know, besides, of course, the second covenant of Jesus Christ that we have. It's still very much a part of our life, and yet Paul keeps saying, the law will not save you, the law leads to death. And every time I, I, I've heard that in the past, I just feel bothered by that. Why is he so insistent? But you see what he is trying to teach the Galatians in us and why he's so passionate. The law was given to us because of our disobedience, because we strayed from God. So God gave us the law to lead us back to obedience. However, it could only take us to a certain point. We could never be saved with the law. Only in Jesus Christ are we saved in believing Him and following Him. 
So he wants to say, if you're still holding on to the law as though that will save you, it's not going to save you. It will only take you to a certain place. You must believe in Jesus and follow him, and then you will have life. Now, please understand me. I, Paul was not saying any more than Jesus was saying. We should throw out the law. Not at all. I'm sure Paul was accused of saying that just as Jesus was. But he's saying, I didn't come to throw it out, but to fulfill it. Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law, so follow him and everything will fall into place. But this is key, this understanding of the law and salvation is key to our understanding of the whole debate between faith and works, what has divided Christianity for centuries. I urge you to keep praying about that and studying it and learning about that. But a lot of it comes from Galatians and Paul's attempt to to teach us the truth. Of special interest in Galatians is Paul's take on the Council of Jerusalem. Remember that where he met with Peter and Barnabas and some others and talked about, you know, what should we do? All these Gentiles seem to want to embrace the faith. Should they have to become Jews first and then Christians? Remember? That's a, a simplification. But anyway, Paul talks about that and how he met with Peter, how they agreed on that. But he also told Peter, you're wrong about some other things. And Peter, to his credit, listened to him. And they moved forward together. Okay, Ephesians. Even though this is addressed to the church in Ephesus, this letter deals with the whole church, the church in general. Paul teaches that the church is an instrument of salvation for all the world. In the introduction, it quickly becomes clear that now Paul is speaking in cosmic, universal terms. You can just read um, from the introduction and you see that. It speaks a lot about the church as a body, the body of Christ, a sign of the unity of Christ, that to which all the followers of Christ belong, Jews and Gentiles alike. One can hear Paul's desire not only to teach the truth that we have received in Christ, but to bridge the differences between the two communities in chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. And I'll read that. And the two communities I mean are the Jewish Christians and the Gentiles. Can you imagine how passionate they were in opposing each other? Yes, they were all baptized, they all believed in Jesus. But the Jewish Christians naturally were saying, we've been doing this all our life, and you're newcomers. We need to teach you how to do this. You know, how to keep God's law and all of that. And the newcomers were saying, but we did away with that. We don't need to do it now. Can you imagine? So Paul writes to them, expressing the unity that they have in chapter 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the holy ones and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the capstone. Through him the whole structure is held together and grows into a temple sacred in the Lord. In him you are also being built, in, being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So he's trying to stitch this community together by saying, you, you formed this, the, the, the prophets, the apostles, they're all forming the foundation and you're being built on that together in unity in God. In Christ Jesus. Okay. The author does take on some specific matters in Ephesians, like family, familial relationships, the famous passage about wives being subordinate to your husbands, and husbands loving their wives, and the relationship between slaves and masters. But overall, his theme is much more grand than any specific issue. And he says in chapter 5, I like this a lot, again, look at this, the cosmic terms, if you will. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Lastly, because this letter seems to represent a later, perhaps more refined understanding of the church, Many think that it was written after Paul had died, as late as 80 or 100. 
although many also believe that this was written by Paul himself while in captivity, addressing not a single church but all of the churches around the years 61 through 63. We're trying to figure out, but because, you know, they didn't put what date they were written, they're not copyrighted or anything like that, we don't know, and so there's a lot of disagreement. The Philippians. Once again, in the Acts of the Apostles, we read about Paul's travels to Philippi. Here's what is written in chapter 16 of the, of the Acts of the Apostles. From there we went to Philippi, a leading city in that district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We spent some time in that city. The we, by the way, probably refers to Paul, Luke, and Silas. There they were falsely accused of disturbing the peace and were in prison. Remember the story about when they were in prison, the earthquake breaking open the doors and the chains fell from their legs and they were free. That comes from, from there. Thus, Paul declares that the first Christian community is established in that city of Philippi. As with some of the other letters, Paul writes to the Philippians while he is in captivity. So some think he wrote it while he was held captive in Rome between 59 and 63. Others think that it was written earlier in another place. It's similar in theme to many other letters. It expresses Paul's love and concerns for the Philippians and his desire that they should persevere in the faith. He's certainly not as passionate and angry as he is in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Galatians. In fact, this seems to be one of the more tender letters, if you will, and it has thus been called the letter of joy. It is here that we have the antiphon that we use in our liturgy on Laetare Sunday in Lent. That antiphon that says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I shall say it again, rejoice. Of special interest in the letter to the Philippians is that Christological hymn that Paul inserted in his letter. The one that says, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be held on to, but emptied himself, taking the form of human beings. It was thus that he humbled himself coming slave, dying for us, and thus he was raised on high. It's really an awesome, awesome summary, if you will, of the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. We believe, scholars believe that, um, that that was a hymn that was already known to Christians before Paul wrote this letter, and he just inserted it in his letter. And also of special interest in this letter, at least for me, is his analogy of a race and the the prize of Christ Jesus. He says, It is not that I have already taken hold of it or have already attained perfect maturity, but I continue my pursuit in hope that I may possess it, since I have indeed been taken possession of by Christ. By Christ. Just one thing, he writes, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I continue, continue my pursuit toward the goal prize of God's upward calling in Christ Jesus. That's from chapter 3, 12 to 16. Colossians. Boy, we're going through these letters pretty quickly, and I'm just scratching the surface, as you know, for each one. I'm just trying to give you something to think about for each of the letters. Colossians. This letter was written, like so many others, to address certain issues within a Christian community. It seems that some have come through that city and confused the Colossians with their talk about spiritual powers and principalities in heaven and cosmic elements, as well as very difficult ascetical practices. And Paul notes that this is not only confusing them, but it's detracting them from the true nature of our faith, namely, believing in Jesus and following him. Paul did not bring the faith to Colossae, but his companion, and as he calls him, his fellow slave, Epaphras, did, as he mentions in his introduction to the letter. In the letter, he brings the Colossians back down to earth, and that's my phrase, by teaching them that they should be more concerned with their own behaviors and practices than on cosmic elements, you know, the principalities and thrones, dominions, and all of that. 
and worrying about, you know, who is the most knowledgeable and the most gifted and all of that. I think we could rightly look at chapter 3 as the summary of the letter when Paul urges them to put to death the parts of you that are earthly, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. And, as he writes, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And over all these put on love, that is, the bond of perfection. Basically, he's saying, don't worry so much about all of that and all these things that will confuse you and the people who came to town talking about these. Just worry about yourself and the way you are following or are not following Jesus. The date is uncertain. It could refer to, it could have been written during any number of Paul's imprisonments. Or, some scholars say, it could even have been written much later by a disciple of Paul. 1 Thessalonians. Paul traveled to Greece and Thessalonica a few times, as recorded where, again, Acts of the Apostles. He went through the area and preached extensively with Timothy and Silvanus. But he was harassed and had to leave Thessalonica while the two others stayed behind. Timothy brought him a report which served as the basis for writing his letter. It says so right in chapter 3, verse 6. But just now Timothy has returned to us from you, bringing us the good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us and long to see us as we long to see you. Much of the letter deals with Paul's ministry and his travels. As well, he offers some teaching and a lot of encouragement and an exhortation to persevere in living their faith until the day of the Lord, which is very appropriate for us in this mini-season in November when we talk about getting ready, being prepared, waiting, hoping for the coming of the Lord. Using the information that we have from the Acts of the Apostles regarding the missionary trips, it appears that this letter was probably written around A.D. 50 or 51. Second letter to the Thessalonians. This is a very short letter, just three chapters. They get smaller and smaller. That's why these reflections on this letter is getting smaller and smaller. This is also addressed to the church in Thessalonica. Some of the wording is taken exactly from the first letter, but the overall tone is different. Whereas Paul dealt briefly in 1 Thessalonians on the need to stay sober and alert for the coming of the Lord, the author of 2 Thessalonians seems to be concerned with countering a false claim that the Lord has already come back, the day of the Lord has already happened. Someone had tricked or taught the Thessalonians, some of them anyway, that the day of the Lord has happened, thus really confusing them. Apparently someone preached in Paul's name, or even forged a letter from him, saying that very same thing. So the author takes this on, and it's interesting, he seems even to confuse himself. Paul is saying, look, it hasn't happened, it's going to happen, and here's how it will unfold. Chapter 2. If you'd like to read that, go ahead, but make sure you're really awake when you read it, and just read it slowly. Because it is a bit confusing. You almost get the sense that Paul kind of was confused, just trying to explain the order of everything. But for me, chapter, or I'm sorry, verse 15 in chapter 2 kind of sums up the nature of the letter well. This is what he writes in that verse. Therefore, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter. Some say that Paul wrote this letter shortly after the first letter to the Thessalonians. Others see it as having been written much later, perhaps again by someone appealing to Paul's authority. 1 Timothy. Now we get to the pastoral letters. The first seven are written to the churches, and now the pastoral letters. I'm sorry, the first nine are written to the churches. We have two Corinthians and two Thessalonians. Um, 1 Timothy, now we'll get to that, okay. Probably written later in Paul's career, because they're quite different in style and content than the other writings. The goal of these letters is to exhort not so much whole communities, but the leaders to hold fast to what they've received, 
and thus to bring order and unity to the church. Timothy, whom Paul converted, was a companion of Paul's during his second and third missionary journeys. You can see that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16 and 19. Paul must have trusted Timothy completely because we also see him sending Timothy on very special missions. In fact, in 1, 3, we read that Paul instructed Timothy to remain in Ephesus as the leader of that community. Because he's writing to Timothy as a leader or pastor, it makes sense that he would exhort him to be faithful in his leadership and to, be, and to select others who would be faithful as well. He tries to keep Timothy and others grounded and not to be swayed by knowledge or false practices. If from Timothy, if it is from, if it is from Paul, it can be dated in the mid-60s, between the time of his first Roman imprisonment and his execution, that is, 63 to 67. If, as some suggest, it was written much later, it could even be dated to the second century. Second letter of Timothy. The introduction in the New American Bible says that it's more of the same of the first one, though the tone is more personal again in the second letter. He calls Timothy, my dear child, and says, I yearn to see you again, recalling your tears so that I may be filled with joy as I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and that I am confident lives also in you. Talk about personal, isn't that neat? He talks about you know, his, his mother and his grandmother and said, they had strong faith, they passed it on to you. You hold fast to the faith of your grandmother and your mother. It's interesting to read that Paul tells Timothy to find others who can continue the work of God just as Paul found Timothy to continue his work. Once again, Paul uses the analogy of a race, saying, I have competed well. I have finished the race. From now on, the prize awaits me. Love that. Okay, Titus. Titus was another co-worker of Paul, as we read in verse 5, chapter 1. Paul says to Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete, so that you might set right what remains to be done, and appoint presbyters in every town, as I directed you. Titus was a companion of Paul and Barnabas in Jerusalem and on other missionary journeys. Titus was a Gentile Christian sent to speak to the Greek-speaking people on the island of Crete. Philemon. Philemon is a very short book, just 25 verses. If you ever quote or cite Philemon, you don't have to say chapter 1, verse 3. There's no chapters, just, just quote the verses. It's not the shortest book in the Bible, by the way. Obadiah in the Old Testament has 21 verses, and the second and third letters of John are smaller yet. It was written by Paul during his imprisonment in Rome, perhaps, around the year AD 61 to 63. It deals with one very specific instance, but one that has wide-ranging effects on our faith today. Onesimus was a runaway slave who was converted to Christianity by Paul while he was in prison. Now, Paul sends him back to his former owner, Philemon, with this letter, urging him to receive him back not as a runaway slave deserving death, but as you would receive me, a brother in the Lord. Pretty radical, then, as it would be today. Basically, that person deserved death for running away and stealing, if you get that from the letter. You can infer that he stole as well as from ran away. He deserves death, but Paul is saying, he's been converted. I hold him very dear, and I want you to receive him back. Now, Paul lays it on thick in this letter. He's saying, I'm an old man, you know, and don't have to listen to me, but, you know, Timothy or Philemon, we've been through a lot, you know me, I'm in prison. Um, so I'm not going to force you to do this, but I really think you should. Oh, and you owe me a lot because I have done so much for you. It's so great to read that in there. 
you know, Phil and I, sure, we never know what happened, but I kind of hope that he welcomed him back. There is a, um, an interesting legend that says that Onesimus not only was welcomed back, but became a leader in the faith. Our own St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote later about a bishop called Onesimus. But I think, this, as it says in the introduction here, it's probably a bit of a stretch to think that he could have gone from slave to being bishop of the community. But, who knows, in those early days in the church, they took this literally, and they did, they did pretty well, obviously. So it's nice to think about. Anyway, it shows that we are all equal in the eyes of God, and this is extremely challenging today, as it was back then. And here's where I ran out of material. I was going to start Hebrews, but I thought we're probably just at the hour, time period. I'll pick up Hebrews and the letters of John, Jude, James, Peter, and the book of Revelation next week for the last session. So get ready for the big conclusion with dragons and stars being swept from the sky and thrones and principalities. Thank you very much for your attention, and may God bless you all.